Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Benjamin Friedman, the William Joseph Mayer Professor of Political Economy and formerly chairman of the Department of Economics at Harvard University. Ben is the second outstanding economist to speak today. He's the author and editor of several books, as well as the author of more than 150 articles on monetary economics, macroeconomics, and monetary and fiscal policy, all published in all the important journals. Ben is also the co-editor with Frank Hand together of the Handbook of Monetary Economics published in 1990. He has written extensively on economic policy and in particular on the role of financial markets in shaping the way in which monetary and fiscal policy affect all the overall macroeconomic activity. Today, Ben will talk about the intellectual origins of the financial crisis and he will put that into perspective with all thoughts that Karl Brunner did many years ago. So thank you very much, Ben. The floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas, for your very kind introduction and also thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful celebration of a wonderful person. I'm really very delighted to be here. Uh, I have uh, only one slide, which I'm going to show. I have, uh, my paper has two epigrams, which I think represent something of the thinking and importance of Karl Brunner. And I will turn to the two epigrams. You can, I think, understand why I associate these two statements with Carl, and uh, this is the only slide that I will show. I'm very honored to take part in remembering today a great economist and at the same time a great human being, Carl Brunner. Like many economists of my generation, I learned enormously from Carl. And I did so at an early and therefore formative stage of my own journey in economics. Moreover, I was fortunate to learn from Carl not just through his work, but in person. I respected him and I liked him. At this distance now, going on 20 years, it gives me real pleasure to remember him. I also remember with affection his beloved Rosemary. One of my most painful memories is of my telephone conversation with Carl the day he called me to tell me Rosemary had died. I'm also honored to share this program this morning with Ellen Meltzer. Likewise to me, both a mentor and a friend dating from my first years of working in our field. The work of Carl's that I know and from which, years ago, I learned so much, was entirely co-authored with Alan. When I refer to Carl in what follows, therefore, I am referring to Alan as well. The repeated locution would be cumbersome, and so I will not use it, but henceforth for Carl, one should understand Carl and Alan. And it will not surprise people to note that uh, the first two of the subjects that I will address follow closely parts of Alan's presentation. Any intellectual discipline is a realm of ideas, and economics is no exception. But more so than most, economics is a discipline in which ideas have human consequences and are meant to do so. Indeed, that was the intent from the outset. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which laid the basis for what became modern economics, was a part of his and David Hume's project to create a science of man comparable to what Newton had earlier produced for the inanimate world. But it was also, in part, a how-to-do-it book, a recipe for elevating a country with a low standard of living, think Smith's Scotland, to a higher level of economic development, 
as in England, to which Scotland had joined itself within the lifetime of Smith's father. The subsequent evolution of economics through the 19th century in England, including Ricardo's novel conception of international trade, and later the protracted debates over banking arrangements and the Corn Laws. In America, Whelan's early understanding of the role of technological progress in fueling economic growth, something incidentally that we take for granted now, but that both Smith and Ricardo had missed entirely. And then Ely's emphasis on the role of laws and institutions, likewise combine theory for the sake of enhanced understanding with theory as a basis for practical action. In the 20th century, both Keynes's response to the depression of the 1930s and Milton Friedman's response to post-World War II price inflation, which together created macroeconomics as we now know it, reflected a similar two-way connection between ideas and events. Each, McCain's and Friedman, argued that the problem in hand was in part the consequence of incomplete theoretical understanding. And each was intended to have policy implications, which indeed both did. In the international arena as well, as Filippo Cesarano has shown in some detail, the Bretton Woods arrangements and institutions that emerged from World War II were very much a product of the economic theorizing of that time. The economically developing, developed, economically developed world's most, most recent first magnitude event the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, and now its extended aftermath, likewise stands as both the product of incomplete economic theory and, one can hope, a spur to new thinking. The crisis and the economic downturn that it triggered represented one of the most significant economic events since World War II. In many countries, the real economic costs costs in terms of reduced production, lost jobs, shrunken investment, and foregone income and profits, exceeded that of any post-war decline. In the United States, the peak to trough decline in real output marked a post-war record. In the Euro area, the decline was the first outright contraction since the establishment of the common currency. In Japan, the decline was likewise a post-war record. The decline affected countries in nearly all parts of the world, and the volume of world trade contracted sharply as well. Eight years later, in no large country has the economy yet fully recovered. It was in the financial sector, however, that this most recent episode primarily stood out. The collapse of major financial firms the decline in asset values and in consequent destruction of paper wealth, the interruption of credit flows, the loss of confidence both in firms and in credit market instruments, the fear of default by counterparties, and above all, the intervention by central banks and other governmental institutions were all extraordinary both in scale and in scope. Whether the 2000 seven to nine financial crisis constituted the worst real economic downturn since World War II was, for many countries, a close call. But there is no question that for the world's financial system, what happened was the greatest crisis since the 1930s. Like the depression of the 1930s and the pervasively high and persistent inflation of the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, the financial crisis was in part a consequence of happenstance and idiosyncratic events. And like those two formative episodes, however, the crisis was also the product of incomplete understanding and consequently flawed thinking solidly within the sphere of economics, 
and especially macroeconomics as an intellectual discipline. It is never possible to replay with confidence under one counterfactual assumption or another the historical development of any given line of thought, much less the real-world consequences that follow from it. But there is certainly reasonable ground to believe that if macroeconomics in the decades leading up to the financial crisis had followed more closely along the lines of Karl Brunner's thinking, the mindset that stood behind the crisis, both among economists and among policymakers, would have been different. And on the principle shared by Keynes and Hayek, that theory can and does drive both policies and institutions. In that case, at least some of the important underpinnings of the crisis would not have been present, and many of the responses to the crisis would have been different too. Three elements of the pre-crisis macroeconomic thinking stand out in this uh, regard. One is the pervasive disregard of credit markets. Here, I'm paralleling one part of Al Allen's remarks. Uh, one is the pervasive disregard of credit markets, and in parallel, the lack of attention to the differences among various credit market instruments. Although the subject was central to the economics of an earlier era, and it was central to the thinking of Karl Brunner, markets for debt instruments issued by an economy's private agents sit uncomfortably within the methodology of modern macroeconomics. If two firms or two households are identical, there is no reason one would borrow from or lend to another. Hence, the, macro, the representative agent construct, a device of convenience that now enables much of formal theorizing in macroeconomics, immediately excludes markets for private assets and liabilities, except in the abstract sense that a market can exist and an implicit price or return is determined with no volume of trading in this context, meaning no actual borrowing or lending. Familiar ways of breaking this restriction include distinguishing young households from old ones, as in the overlapping generations model, and distinguishing risk-tolerant households from risk-averse ones. But these highly stylized departures fail to capture most of what happens in actual credit markets. One reason the technical difficulty of accommodating credit markets within the now ubiquitous in macroeconomics representative agent technology has attracted so little resistance within the field is the lingering conceptual legacy of treating all non-money assets as perfect substitutes. Not something Karl Brunner would have done. Unlike the Brunner-Meltzer version of 1960s, 1970s monetarism, which explicitly incorporated a private credit market by including the household sector's balance sheet, including both assets and liabilities, most versions of Milton Friedman's monetarism normally omitted assets other than money and therefore omitted private sector liabilities altogether. To be sure, he and other proponents of this line of thought understood that households and firms do have both assets and liabilities. But the assumption, supposedly grounded in empirical evidence, was that the quantity of assets held by the public other than money did not matter for purposes of macroeconomic questions, nor did differences among those non-money assets nor did either the quantity or the character of liabilities issued by the public. In short, all non-money assets are perfect substitutes. In combination, the lack of attention to private credit markets in general and the assumption that if such instruments exist, they are all perfect substitutes, rendered modern professional macroeconomic thinking unequipped <clears throat> 
either to anticipate or to address, once they had arisen, many of the phenomena at the root of the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. In the years leading up to the crisis, many economists understood that the United States was building too many new houses, more than two million per year during much of 2004, 2005, and 2006. But few paid attention to the credit market conditions that enabled this extraordinary surge of home construction. Namely, increasingly lax underwriting standards, hence the sale of many of these houses to purchasers with fragile prospects of servicing the debt they took on in order to finance them. In parallel, high exposure of the lenders, some of them highly leveraged, to risk in the event of delinquency or default by the borrowers. And the further compounding of these problems by the proliferation of derivative instruments that magnified the exposure and attracted yet additional classes of investors to assume it. It is no accident that these phenomena, as they built up, attracted attention primarily among finance economists and from practitioners, but not from macroeconomists. If the instincts of more macroeconomists had been channeled along the lines laid out in any of the early Brunner-Meltzer models, for example, the 1968 and 1972 JPE papers, or the paper in the 1976 Stein volume, or even the overview chapter in the 1990 Friedman Hahn handbook, not only might these dangerous developments have attracted attention earlier, but the implications for economic policy might have been better understood. In the same way, these early Brunner-Meltzer models typically included a banking sector, something that is also missing in most modern macroeconomic models, but that stood at the center of the financial crisis. Lack of attention to credit markets and the failure to distinguish credit market or credit worthy borrowers and liabilities from dubious ones was a matter of having over time lost track of what not so long ago was a central part of macroeconomics as represented by Karl Brunner's work. A second reason for macroeconomists' general failure to anticipate the 2007 to 9 crisis was a matter of what was not in Brunner's work, but had nonetheless become standard by the time of the crisis, namely the application of rigorous notions of optimization by individual households and firms, including the assumption that these actors assess their economic environment according to so-called rational expectations, together with the assumption of universal and continuous market clearing. And here I'll paralleling another part of Alan's talk. The idea that individuals and firms act to further their self-interest dates to the very beginnings of modern economics. Unlike the mercantilists who preceded him, Adam Smith assumed that people mostly understand what is in their self-interest when they act as producers of goods and services. Interestingly, Smith never applied this assumption to people's behavior as consumers. To the contrary, he was dismissive, often contemptuous, in his scorn for what he called the foolishness and childishness of consumers' misguided choices. Given this prior assumption, that is, that people understand what is in their self-interest when they act as producers of goods and services, Smith then proceeded on the assumption that people act accordingly. The subsequent introduction of utilitarianism in the 19th century ultimately, ultimately facilitated the extent of this notion of the pursuit of self-interest to optimization, according to which people not only act to further their self-interest, but do so to the maximum extent possible. <clears throat> 
Along the way, everyone, of course, understood that expectations of future economic conditions and events matter for many economically relevant choices. In the early 20th century, Keynes emphasized the role of expectations, but he had little to say about how those expectations are formed. Following the work of Muth and Lucas in the latter decades of the century, the standard working hypothesis among macroeconomics became that of so-called rational expectations, meaning, as Alan indicated, that individual agents, on average, form their views of the future as if they know and apply the model corresponding to the process that actually delivers future outcomes. Standard macroeconomic analysis accompanied this line of analysis with transversality conditions imposing the further requirement that individual agents on average do not make the mistake of acting in any market as if a process that cannot go on forever, cannot go on forever again under the model corresponding to the process that actually delivers the outcomes, will do so. Taken on their own terms, this set of assumptions is not necessarily a bad way to discipline macroeconomic analysis. In the absence of either optimization or some well-specified alternative to it, a very broad range of representations of economic behavior are potentially consistent with pursuit of self-interest. Similarly, in the absence of either model-consistent expectations or some well-specified alternative to them, any representation of beliefs about the future is potentially admissible. Given the practical limitations on empirical identification and inference, such undisciplined thinking risks absorbing degrees of freedom well beyond what most macroeconomic analysis can bear. But assumptions can unhelpfully restrict thinking as well, and the recent crisis stands as a case in point. The question here is how to apply the presumption that people always act optimally, or that on average they form their beliefs about the future rationally, or that markets always clear. Surely no one interprets the optimization assumption to mean that nobody ever does anything foolish. But to what extent can foolish behavior predominate in one market sector or other? Similarly, no one interprets so-called rational expectations to imply that no price in any market is ever at an incorrect level, meaning, again, a level other than the appropriately conditioned equilibrium implied by the solution of the model corresponding to the process that determines outcomes. But what kinds of departure are admissible? Most economists accept, I think, that the market can misprice the shares of any one company or any one borrower's bonds. But can the market misprice the equity of an entire class of companies or the debt of an entire category of borrowers? Can the stock market as a whole establish a wrong price? Can the bond market? Even if they did not take these familiar assumptions to their logical extreme, most macroeconomists during the buildup to the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis were unwilling to give serious weight to the prospect that the price being paid for many new houses being built, and in the secondary market as well, was too high or that the interest rate being charged on a wide class of mortgage debt was systematically too low, or that the price of the securities backed by these instruments was therefore too high, or that large numbers of institutions that invested in these securities were bearing risk well outside their safe range of tolerance. Finally, in addition to preventing standard macroeconomic thinking from anticipating the crisis or even understanding what was happening once the crisis began, the mindset 
shaped by these assumptions often blocked serious consideration of what would have been corrective policies. The most glaring example was in the regulation of mortgage lending. Beginning long in advance of the crisis, not only some private individuals, but various agencies within the U.S. government urged a tightening of mortgage lending standards or restrictions on institutions' freedom to invest in mortgage-backed security products, or both. In 2001, the Treasury Department tried to get subprime lenders to ex ex adopt a code of best practices and to submit to regulatory monitoring. The Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development likewise proposed a set of new rules for real estate transactions. As late as 2006, there was an interagency government initiative to regulate non-traditional mortgage products, including in particular subprime loans. In 2007, Edward Gramlich, then a governor serving on the Federal Reserve Board, published a book calling public attentions to concerns about subprime mortgages that he had been expressing for some time within the U.S. Central Bank. All of these warnings were systematically ignored and the proposed initiatives blocked or rejected, largely on the ground that government regulation of credit markets populated by rational investors was unnecessary. Investors would rationally judge the value of the instruments that they bought. Just as important to how the crisis played out, bank depositors, meaning in this case the purchases of bank liabilities in large amounts extending beyond the limits covered by deposit insurance, would presumably monitor on their own the balance sheets of the banks to which they lent and would therefore exercise a non-government, and therefore presumably more effective, regulatory function by not lending to those banks that took on excessive risk. This form of privately imposed safety and soundness regulation would apply even more so to shadow banks whose liabilities were entirely unsure, uninsured and which did not have access to central bank lending in the event of any difficulty. In the end, as we know, these beliefs were dramatically falsified. As Alan Greenspan stated, after the largest U.S. banks and shadow banks avoided failure only by turning to government bailouts, and here I quote Alan, those of us who have looked to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, myself included, are in a state of shocked disbelief. End of quote from Greenspan. This basic failure of understanding, together with the devastating consequences to which the resulting government inaction led, was in part the product of excessive reliance on the twin assumptions of optimizing behavior and so-called rational expectations. A further part of the explanation, however, was the failure to take account of principal-agent relationships, the ph phenomenon that a hundred years ago, soon to be Justice Brandeis, labeled other people's money. Many of the individuals buying these mispriced mortgage-backed securities and unsound bank deposits did so using not their own funds, but those of institutions by whom they were employed and whose interests were, at best, only loosely aligned with their own. In the end, the key figures whose actions led to the failure, or near failure, or failure but for government intervention, of many of these institutions mostly came out very well personally. At one point during the aftermath of the crisis, Alan Greenspan commented that he did not personally know or know of any executive of a U.S. bank who had either gone bankrupt personally or had lost his or her house. The share owners of the institutions that employed these people did not come out so well, however. 
In the same way that relying on private market participants to impose safe and safety and soundness regulation on lending institutions led both economists and policymakers astray, commitment to the belief that markets clear always and everywhere likewise clouded many macroeconomists' assessment of proposed central bank actions. Once the reality of an out-and-out -out financial crisis became apparent, many longtime students of monetary economics urged central banks to follow Walter Badgett's famous dictum of lending freely to solvent institutions at a penalty rate on good collateral. The Badgett principle has much to recommend it. If it is clear which institutions are solvent, and what collateral is good. Under systems of dysfunctionality like those prevailing in the US residential mortgage market and the market for mortgage-backed derivative instruments, however, neither judgment is straightforward. Moreover, the problem in applying the Badgett rule is conceptually more difficult than merely needing to evaluate some credit market instrument or some investing institution's portfolio under disorderly market conditions. During the crisis, markets were sufficiently broken that whether some credit was worth 80 or 40 or perhaps nothing at all depended crucially on what action the central bank itself would take. Would the central bank intervene? If so, what instruments would it buy and how much of each? Which instruments constituted good collateral and which lending institutions were solvent were therefore in both instances endogenous with respect to the central bank's own actions. Under such conditions, the Badgett rule becomes operationally meaningless, not just as a matter of technicalities of impl implementation, but in its fundamental logic. None of this would have surprised Carl Bruner. He understood that households and firms do the best they can to achieve their ends, and that people do not heedlessly ignore available and potentially valuable information. Carl understood, of course, the implications of market clearing and the reasons for believing that, at least in advanced economies with well-developed economic and financial systems, many markets do clear much of the time. But his work did not turn these useful principles into a methodological diktat capable of blinding economists to what happens outside the realm of highly stylized theoretical analysis. Likewise, although principal agents were not central to Bruner's work, or at least not to the part I know, he certainly understood them, and he likely understood their implications as well. Unlike the DSGE models in standard use today, Bruner-Meltzer models had banks. It is impossible to know what would have happened differently if the ideas and methods with which macroeconomists approached the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis and then assessed potential reactions to it, not just the concrete models they had in their toolkit, but the central insights that shaped their uh, intuition had followed more closely in some extension of the channel of thinking that Carl Bruner laid out during his long and astonishingly productive time with us. But as both Keynes and Hayek agreed, human affairs are guided by intellectual forces, and the ideas of economists in particular are more powerful than is commonly understood. Carl knew this. This was why he did the work he did and why he cared about its acceptance among his fellow economists, among policymakers, and more broadly within the body politic. He was right. I miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, so much for this uh, brilliant uh, speech and uh, presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes' time to discuss. Maybe if I can start with the first question. What would be your advice uh, 
to central banks and regulate this to avoid the next financial crisis, given your analysis? To avoid the next financial crisis. Uh, this, is a, this, this is a tall order. Let me first say something that uh, our uh, relevant authorities are doing correctly, I think, and that's to increase the capital requirements on uh, leveraged uh, institutions. And uh, here my complaint is that they are not doing anywhere near enough. Uh, my sense is that in the United States, uh, our banks have made some progress but not enough. Uh, I'm uh, a guest in Europe, and therefore I will not comment on the uh, progress that your banks have not made. <laughs> that would, well, that Switzerland, would, that, Europe that, is not that, exactly that the same. That, that, would be, that, would, that, that, would be, that would be impolite. But now I'll go further. Uh, I think, uh, especially in uh, the United States, I think corporate governance is quite broken. And I think... Uh, the fact that uh, the stockholders of, uh, let's just take one example, the stockholders of Citibank watch their stock go from $55 to 97 cents. It's now back up to about $4. Watch to go from $55 to 97 cents in the absence of government intervention. Of course, it would have gone to zero. The bank uh, failed and then sat back calmly and watched as the management uh, awarded its, in, 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 uh, uh, as, a, as a reward for the wonderful performance of the bank in the year in which the stock went from $55 to 97 cents, the bank awarded, uh, the bank's management awarded itself two billion, with a B, billion, dollars worth of bonuses, a direct transfer from what little was left for the equity holders to the pockets of the management. Uh, uh, it, it is hard to understand anybody's notion of corporate governance that says uh, this, is, uh, this is working well, and one can go on with many other examples. So the second thing uh, I would do is to uh, focus on uh, corporate uh, uh, on corporate uh, uh, governance, and the third thing I would do would be to take quite seriously the notion that many of our institutions are not just too big to to uh, fail, which is a statement about scale but too big to manage, which is a statement about scope. Uh, we had in the United States uh, the uh, other day the astonishing uh, performance in which the chief executive of one of our four largest banks appeared before Congress to explain that at his bank there had been a fraudulent practice Undergoing, undergone for uh, a series of years that, eventually, that wound up in the dismissal of more than 5,000 of the bank's employees, but of course he knew nothing of it. Ne ne never, 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 the, f the phenomenon never crossed, ne never crossed his desk. Now, I happen to, I happen to believe him. I, I'm quite prepared to believe that the phenomenon never crossed his desk. But the conversation, that's not the, the end of the conversation. That's the beginning of the conversation. And where that conversation then goes is something about uh, the scope of banking not the scale. We're not talking about the dollars. We're talking about the range of, to use the banker's vocabulary, the range of businesses in which they are engaged. There should be one business in which they are engaged, and it's called banking. There shouldn't be all of this other stuff. So I would uh, have uh, not just some much more uh, strict enforcement of what we now call the Volcker Rule. I would have a much more rigorous uh, establishment of uh, separations uh, 
in which uh, the lines of uh, business that banking are uh, the lines of business that banking are engaged in are uh, uh, are uh, separated. To go back to the Citibank example, management's explanation for the two billion dollars of uh, bonuses, incidentally, was that it was necessary to pay the CEO of Fibro, the energy trading firm, an extremely large bonus because Fibro had actually done very well. And then the bonuses got scaled off of, for the rest of the bank, got scaled off of what Fibro had, had earned. But again, that's not the, shouldn't be the end of the conversation. That should begin, be the beginning where the conversation is supposed to go is why as a bank, own an energy trading firm. So I think <clears throat> one could go on, but those, those would be my yeah. three uh, first-line choices. Thanks. I already see many hands up. Please, for the first question. Then. Patrick Minford. Um, I, uh, I loved your talk, uh, uh, Professor Friedman. Um, but you've got two whipping boys, rational expectations and bankers to cut it short. And uh, I think the point about rational expectations is a modeling assumption. And it must be addressed as a modeling assumption. It's not supposed to be a reality. And I, I, I'd appeal to Carl on this, because Carl was always fair-minded when it came to debates. And he didn't like, well, he liked whipping boys when they were his enemies. Um, and uh, he engaged us in that process. But, I, th I think that's the first point. It's a modeling assumption. It's a very successful modeling assumption. It's got to be taken in that spirit. And I think in, in talking about uncertainty, as Carl uh, did and Alan did, um, I don't think anybody who advises on policy thinks models are absolutely accurate representations of the world. They use them as guides and helps. And I, I'm sure you're sympathetic to that. The other whipping by bankers, I would say, well, OK, bankers are not uh, any more than the rest of us great human beings and are capable of all sorts of errors and uh, frauds and so forth. But who encouraged them? Central banks presided over an enormous credit boom in the 2000s. You know, uh, they were pursuing inflation targets, but they permitted an enormous growth of money and credit. Um, and they were persuaded to, to disregard it by the kind of inflation targeting orthodoxy. You know, the ECB dropped its second pillar because Michael Woodford came and told them it was a terrible mistake to look at money. So my question would be, well, are central bankers blameless in all this since they encouraged the bankers to, to provide masses of credit? They made credit very cheap during the 2000s. John Taylor's gone around saying that they ignored even the Taylor rule. And, and so my question is, central bankers are pretty guilty here. And they turned around and blamed the bankers and brought in enormous regulation as a kind of way of kind of getting people to ignore their own mistakes. And the question I think you've got to ask as we kind of sip our whiskey and rye um, is, you know, are we in fact indulging in a terrible mistake in over-regulation in the modern environment where we're using bankers as a whipping boy to introduce regulation instead of control of money and credit? And I think Carl would have been very, very doubtful about the modern passion for regulation in place of, of, of monetary rules that control money and credit. Well, Patrick raises two very uh, useful questions. I'll take them in reverse order, in, in, uh, if, if, uh, if I may. Uh, I didn't think I was very gentle on the central bankers either. <laughs> so uh, I, only, I, 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 foc I focused on uh, the one who had been the in charge for the longest period and leading up to the crisis, but I, uh, I, I didn't think I was very uh, gentle on the central bankers, nor, 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 nor did I mean to be. Uh, on your second uh, point, there we may have there we may have some uh, we may have some disagreement, and I'll say just two things. Uh, on the bankers and on the economists. On the bankers, I don't think, first of all, how, how, how does one say, many of my best friends are bankers. So. <laughs> um, uh, the issue, and again, here we go back to the notions of self-interest and uh, 
um, it wasn't Smith, but Rousseau, men, men as they are and laws as they should be. The issue is not to uh, flagellate ourselves or any subset of ourselves over what human nature is. The issue is the framework within which people operate. And so uh, rather than worry about the moral character of bankers, my concern is the uh, framework within which they deal having to do with corporate governance and what, biz what lines, of, and I mentioned what lines of business they're in, I mentioned the weakness of corporate governance, I mentioned the principal agent problems. You know, talk about principal agent problems. Uh, many people in this room are probably more uh, knowledgeable about Henry Thornton uh, and, than I am, and just as uh, much admirers of Henry Thornton uh, as I am. Uh, it's worth reminding ourselves that when Henry Thornton was living and wrote, banks in England were constrained to be unlimited partnerships with no more than six partners. That's what Henry Thornton, that's the world Henry Thornton knew. And to take the insights that people like Thornton gave us from years ago and apply them uh, in a world of the structure and governance of today's banking, uh, I think is uh, completely inappropriate. So part of the issue is it's not that bankers are bad people. They, they are operating under a system that is deeply, deeply flawed. Again, it has to do with things like principal agent problems. But then now the other place where I may disagree with you, Patrick, has to do with the notion that these extreme notions of uh, rational expectations, uh, so-called, and optimization and uh, perpetual and pervasive market clearing are merely modeling assumptions. I think they're not. Uh, I, since we're in a German-speaking place, I'll use uh, Einstein's uh, world for it. I think these, over time, create what Einstein called the Weltbild. Help me with the translate. Would you would you translate that world picture image of image of the world? Uh, when when I when Einstein, I'm always I'm careful in translating it because when Einstein's book Mein Weltbild was translated into English. It, uh, the title put on the book was The World as I See It, mm. which prompted Einstein to write an angry letter to the publisher saying he didn't like the, he didn't like the title uh, in, in English. Uh, but there is a Welt built that is built up from the repeated use of these methodological assumptions. And here, I think, Brunner understood things like this. Methodo methodology matters. Methodology shapes thought patterns. And most human beings are not able to compartmentalize so that we apply every day in our professional work this thought pattern. And then as soon as we turn to something uh, not quite the same, we immediately cast it aside and say, oh, yes, yes, I understand that markets don't clear. I don't think that's right. And I think especially for uh, economists who um, were brought up in that, uh, under that set of assumptions and trained in them, I think it's more than just a modeling assumption. It's part of their Welt built, and that, that's what I was complaining about. Thank you. I have already a long list. Michael Borto first. I want to get to something you, you talked about at the beginning of your talk, and that's about how m most macro models simplify and they just have assumed that all assets are perfect substitutes. Now, if you go back into, you know, into monetarist history, I mean, Friedman and Schwartz had this um, transmission mechanism where there were multiple assets which were imperfect substitutes. And then Bruner and Meltzer also had that. And that's the thinking behind what Bernanke later did. So in a sense, it was, I think you're right. I think that the model simplified and forgot about it. But it was something that was there. It's just that it got kind of simplified out. Okay. Well, we, we, may, we may see Friedman and Schwartz's work differently. What I, what I certainly agree with is that Bruner and Meltzer had a transmission mechanism. They certainly did. Uh, whether the 
whether the transmission mechanism was there in uh, Friedman's work is a, is a different matter. Alan referred to uh, the, who, who was it, Alan, that you said persuaded uh, Milton to put uh, uh, the transmission mechanism into the Friedman Meiselman paper? I, I, you mentioned Harry. Harry. So uh, it was part Harry. And then, of course, there was the Friedman 1972 uh, JPE paper. And if you read the Friedman, not me, by coincidence, I had a, I had a paper in that same issue of the JPE. But uh, the, if you take the Friedman 1972 JPE paper, which was his attempt to say what stood behind the, his notion of the quantity effect that uh, would deliver up real consequences, and you put that side by side with the Brunner-Meltzer paper in the same uh, issue of the JPE, it's very clear which one of them had a transmission mechanism and which one didn't. He had an ISLM model. So Excuse me? What? Out, he had a sophisticated ISLM model. Correct. But in the same way that you were criticizing the ISLM model, I think rightly, for, have, for having no credit market and no non-money assets, except implicitly. I mean, after all, the, the ISLM model has an interest rate. Have to have an, the interest rate has to be on something. So in the background, there are these non-money assets, and that's what the R represents. But uh, other than that, everything else is implicitly a perfect substitute. And in your papers with Carl, it's just not true. It's not true. And in the world. Yes, to be sure. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Sir Walter Bateshot. Actually, I have been thinking along this There's a, line here comes myself. A you mentioned Sir Walter Bateshot. I have been thinking along these lines myself. Therefore, I would like to ask you, uh, would you say that it would have been better for the Fed to follow the proposals by Sir Walter Bateshot? Penalty interest rates, but at the same time, evaluation of the asset side of the banks at normal times. Uh, this is this is in effect uh, Mervyn King's uh, proposal, and, yeah, but you find it and, and well, I I don't I, I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I wish I recently reread it. Yeah, I, I, I wish I, I wish I had a better answer for you, uh, because what we're talking about is uh, so-called fire sale prices, and whether it's the. Uh, role of the central bank to look through the fire sale prices. And I, this is very hard to implement. It comes back again to something that Alan uh, emphasized, having to do with permanent for versus transitory. So you see that, you see that n n n nobody, is, nobody is willing to pay anything for some asset. Now, is that some temporary fire sale thing? And the central bank understands that this, is, uh, that this is temporary and therefore looks through it and evaluates the asset uh, on the basis that it knows somehow that in, uh, in uh, ordinary times the asset is worth uh, whatever it's worth. Or is it that the reason nobody is uh, willing to pay anything for the asset is that everybody has figured out that the thing is actually worthless? Well, this is a hard judgment. And so I, I wish I had, a, I wish I had a, a, a clean answer for you, but, 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 I, but I really don't. And the point that I was after is simply the, endog the endogeneity of these assets. And we had one after another of these in which there was no market for some of these uh, products, including products that bulked large on our bank's balance sheets. Not large compared to the total assets, but large res with respect to the shrunken capital positions. So that whether the Federal Reserve was intervening to buy some assets and therefore made the difference between whether some asset was trading at 30 or 70 had a lot to do with whether some bank was nearing failure or was more or less adequately capitalized. So I, I, again, I, I, wish, I wish I knew enough to give you a, give you a systematic answer, but I don't. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we have time only for two questions, I believe. Here was one, and then Jean-Pierre Dantin, and then I think we should uh, break for lunch. Please. My name is Thomas Lees. I am one of the last generations of Carl students. Uh, I also happen to have been the executor of his estate. Oh, yeah. And so I have known Carl quite well, particularly to the, at the end of his life. And I have to tell you, I may have misunderstood what you said, because I really don't think Carl would have agreed with you, particularly um, your explications of the regulatory implications. Uh, the way I remember Carl, he was quite a free market person, and, um, and he probably would have concluded that many of these excesses uh, while excesses should not lead to more regulation, but maybe even considering less regulation. So I was quite surprised, um, or, but I may have misunderstood, of course, um, your attribution of that. Uh, I think uh, usually when people talk about too big to fail is a view that, in fact, the government would intervene and prevent a bank from failing and not that the bank has become too big to operate. But at any rate, I, and again, uh, the anecdotes about these excesses, the $2 billion, et cetera, are of course clear. But uh, when people resort to that, and I hope Carl, as I remember him, agree, or I, I hope I remember him correctly, um, it's very difficult to kind of extrapolate from these anecdotes and not knowing actually what the alternative is. So that's just a comment. No, I, th I, th I think what you say is fair, and I think, um, I, th I, think, I think you read me correctly. Thomas was careful to point out that in my work, uh, I didn't always agree with all of Carl's conclusions. And uh, well, I, I, I could have talked about my views on monetary targeting, but I chose not to. And I didn't think that was, uh, didn't think that was uh, the, uh, a, a good focus uh, for my remarks. And I think you're, I think you're right. This, uh, what I took from Carl was his views about the positive economics and about methodology and about thought processes. And uh, this, you've put your finger on uh, a way, which is not the only way, and I say that, of course, with respect and admiration and love for the man. Uh, you've put your uh, finger on a way in which, with his economics in hand, and proceeding from his economics in the broadest sense, I often came to differing policy conclusions, and I think this is one. I believe that the conclusions I would draw about regulation are consistent with what I learned from Carl, even though I understand that uh, Carl would not have uh, said that himself, in the same way that I always understood that uh, what I wrote many years ago, and still believe, about monetary targeting was not what Carl said, or, what, or certainly not what Alan said, even though uh, I learned from and used and cited often those Brunner Meltzer models, which I have mentioned today. And so my, um, my debt to Carl uh, my debt to Carl is one having to do with thought process and modeling and uh, intellectual approach, uh, not uh, necessarily that he and I agreed on uh, every policy recommendation, which we did not. And I accept the notion that if Carl were here today, he would have been, uh, uh, he, he, he and I would not agree on the implications for, re for regulation. Jean-Pierre, last question. Okay, be brief, but I'd like to go back to the methodology issue that uh, Patrick hinted at. I, I, I think you I mean, went to the consensus, which he criticized uh, rational expectation and representative agent model. This is not new. I liked it that you bring, brought in the, uh, the third element, which is principal agent. 
and, which and is what did you principal say? Principal agent. Principal agent. Yes, yes, right? yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, then you get into a very difficult question with macroeconomics, especially if you think that the principal agent uh, has led, the, or the status institution that we have had has led to distorted incentives. I'd like to have your comment on, on what you think macroeconomists should do. Uh, I mean, it's nice to have banking in macro models, but if on top of it, regulations makes it uh, that bankers are working with distorted incentives, that you get a very pretty tall challenge for macroeconomists to, to work on the general equilibrium type of models. I have, let me say for, to, be, to be an, I, I, in the realm of principal agent models, I am a consumer, not a producer. I do, to my knowledge, I have never written a uh, principal uh, agent uh, model. I think the place that I might begin is to apply to the banking sector and maybe to the corporate sector more broadly some of the principles, and here I think of Alan, I, I think I think of Alex, although I'm, if I'm misattributing to you, Alex, I apologize. In the line of political economy, we have a very richly developed, uh, a very richly developed uh, literature relating to the incentives of public sector decision making. So it's nothing unusual in economics to talk about the fact that uh, elected officials have a different time horizon from uh, the public that they're supposed to represent, that they have other incentives and so forth. This is absolutely, again, I'm, I haven't, I've never myself written in that vein, but this is absolutely standard. Uh, we don't have a lot of that in the principal agent treatment of either the banking sector or financial uh, or, or uh, financial or even, or even non-financial firms. And so maybe this place to start is to apply to the agents in the private sector what we've already done. Again, that's, that's a loose, that's a, that's a collective we, and I, I haven't written in this vein. Uh, what we've already done in the modeling of public sector uh, agents who have their own private incentives that are uh, often at variance with the, uh, with the, um, uh, the, the objective of the, of, of the principles. Now, I, I should say that I think this problem is more pervasive, and going back to your comment about anecdotes, I think the problem is systemic, not anecdotal. And so I'll give one other example. Uh, we had in the United States uh, within in, the, in recent years uh, a movement that was eventually successful to give share owners of publicly held firms a non-binding vote on the compensation of the executives of the firm, meaning the top five. It was astonishing to see the vigor with which corporate America resisted this idea. The notion that the owners of the firm would be, ev would be allowed to express even a non-binding view of what their employees would be paid was horrifying, horrifying. And so I think we're not here talking about anecdotes. We're talking about the pervasive uh, management of the corporate sector. And incidentally, these are issues that go back to the very uh, depth, the, the origins of political uh, economy. Smith wrote extensively uh, about uh, things like this. We were talking about Badgett. To go back in, in Badgett's day, the central issue for about a decade and a half in British political economy was the limited liability law. The limited liability came up, it was firmly resisted. Many people thought it was immoral that firms ought to be able to borrow and not have to be person, people be personally liable. So these are long, long standing issues in 
you know, long before the word principal agent was ever uh, coined. These are long-standing issues in uh, our discipline, and I think uh, one can, of course, imagine um, the world going on for decades as it did without these issues having uh, obtruded themselves into the realm of macroeconomics, uh, but uh, you know, th th from time to th time, th things happen, and they just did. And so, the notion that they never obtrude themselves into the world of macroeconomics has just been falsified. And macroeconomists, I think, uh, proceed dangerously if they proceed if they assume that this can never happen. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for your really brilliant, brilliant contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much.